Today I'm going to show you what it was like to program the Altair 8800 before people modified them to allow alternate input output peripherals such as tape readers, keyboards, and monitors. I'm going to do that by programming in a simple game, Kill the Bit. If you've seen my other videos, you've seen Kill the Bit before. The LEDs light up in series to simulate the movement of a bit, and the object is to quickly flip a switch up and down to kill that LED. When the Altair was first released, it had no capability to connect to an external peripheral. No monitor, no keyboard, nothing. Input was handled through a set of switches on the front panel, while output was presented through the LEDs. Programming the Altair was done by assigning microprocessor instructions to memory addresses in a sequence, and then running through those addresses in sequence, sending each to the CPU. The Altair 8800 used the shiny new Intel 8080 chip. While not the first commercially available microprocessor, that honor belongs to Intel's 4004, the 8080 was the precursor for the 8086 processor, which formed the backbone for Intel's x86 architecture that's still used today. At a whopping 78 machine instructions, the 8080 is pretty limited, especially by today's standards. But in 1975, it finally allowed hobbyists and tinkerers to experiment with programming without the need for access to an expensive mainframe. An 8080 instruction typically consists of two parts. The instruction itself, called the code, and one or two parameters, called the operand, associated with the code. For instance, an instruction might be add, and the operand would be the two numbers to add, say, 2 and 2. But it's not that simple. In order to even execute this simple operation, you need to tell the computer where and when to store each of the two values for the operand, perform the addition operation, move the result to a new location in memory, and finally examine that location to see the result. On the Altair 8800, you have to set eight switches for each instruction, and then hit a ninth switch to commit the settings each time. With eight instructions, that's up to 72 switch flips just to add two numbers. And if anything happened in between, you basically had to start over from the beginning. Needless to say, programming anything useful on the Altair took lots of time and patience. Now, in order for much of this to make sense, a basic understanding of binary numbers is necessary. As you've no doubt heard in the past, a computer only understands ones and zeros. The reason for this is based on the way a computer works internally, and that might be another video I make one day. But for now, just accept that a computer only understands ones and zeros, so that's how we need to communicate with it. And we do that by converting everything we do to binary numbers. Why? Because a binary number only consists of ones and zeros. A binary number is a number that has a different base. You can convert any number into binary. So since we only have two digits available to us, 0 and 1, we need to figure out how to represent other numbers with zeros and ones. The first two are easy. Decimal 0 equals binary 0. Decimal 1 equals binary 1. But what about 2? Well, in binary, each position in the number becomes 2 raised to the power of the position of the number minus 1. So, position 1 is 2 to the 0 power, position 2 is 2 to the 1st power, position 3 is 2 to the 2nd, position 4 is 2 to the 3rd, and so on. 2 to the 0 power equals 1. Any number raised to the 0 power equals 1. 2 to the 1st power equals 2. 2 squared equals 4. And 2 cubed equals 8. Converting to binary is simply a matter of assigning a 1 to the digits that add up to the number we're converting. All other digits are 0. If I want to represent 2 in binary, 8 is larger than 2, so we put a 0 there. 4 is also larger than 2, so we put another 0 there. 2 equals 2, so we put a 1 in that position. And because we've now selected digits that add up to 2, the remaining position gets a 0. If we want to represent 5, 8 is larger than 5, but 4 is not. So we put a 1 in the 4 column, and we have 1 remaining to add up to 5. 2 is larger than 1, so we put a 0 there, but 1 equals 1, so we put a 1 in the first column. 4 plus 1 equals 5. Here are the binary equivalents of the decimal numbers 0 to 10.
Obviously, the maximum a binary number with only four digits can store is 15. Sixteen would require an extra digit, two to the fourth power, which equals sixteen, or one zero 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 binary. After you work with them for a while, binary conversions will become almost trivial. With that out of the way, let's move on to kill the bit. Kill the bit was written in May of 1975 by Dean McDaniel. I wasn't able to find much about Mr. McDaniel online, but his idea was ingenious. What you're looking at is assembly language. Assembly language was created in the late 1940s to help developers write more readable and thus maintainable code. Assembly is considered a low-level language, and all that really means is that the instructions written correspond closely, many times one-to-one, -to, -one, to machine code. And we'll get into machine code in a little bit, but first, let's dissect the program to see how it works on the Altair. An explanation of computer and microprocessor architectures, memory addressing, assembly language, and computer programming in general are well beyond the scope of this video, so we'll leave them for other potential series. The point of this video is to explain how to program the Altair to run Kill the Bit, so I'll leave my explanations of each instruction at a high level. So let's start with the first instruction and translate it into English. As the comment indicates, this initializes a counter to zero that'll be used in conjunction with two other instructions further down. I'll return to this shortly. For now, let's move on to the next instruction. Here, Mr. McDaniel found an ingenious way to display primitive output on the Altair by using the fact that the Altair's address LEDs light up whenever memory at that address is accessed. By manipulating access to the upright addresses one at a time, he could give the appearance of movement. If we think of each of these lights as ones and zeros, a one is on and a zero is off, we would see a pattern like this. This line of code is simply initializing a variable to the value of 128, which is the binary equivalent of one followed by seven zeros, which is the starting point of the pattern. Let's look at the next line of code. Remember the first line of code that initialized the counter that I said I'd return to later? Well, this line works in conjunction with that line and a line further down in the code. Once we get to that line, I'll explain how they work together. For now, just know that this line sets a multiplier that'll cause the bit to move faster or slower. The next four lines of code are all essentially the same. And from what I can tell, the only reason for four of them is to help control the base speed of the lights. Other than the first statement that also sets a marker as the beginning of a loop, all they do is access the memory using the pattern variable established earlier. If anyone watching this understands them, please let me know in the comments. Remember the two prior statements I said I'd address later? Well, the next statement ties the three together. What it does is add the value stored in B to the counter stored in H. And what does this counter do? Well, ultimately, it controls the speed of the lights. And the next step is what does that. In assembly, this statement means jump if no carry. Without going into a complicated explanation, this instruction tells the computer that if the prior statement didn't set the carry flag, it should jump back to the point in the program indicated by the label, in this case, BEG. What's the carry flag? The carry flag is simply an indicator in the CPU as to whether the prior statement caused the variable being acted upon to grow too large. See, variables in a computer have a finite size, and trying to store a number too large in them causes the data to be carried outside of the variable. What happens with this data is dependent on the size of the variable, the instruction being executed, and a number of other factors, but that's not important for our purposes. This section continually loops from the BEG tag, displaying the light pattern in D and adding the value of B to the value of H on each iteration. Eventually, H will fill up, and upon the next iteration, the carry flag will be set. In other words, the single state of the lights is displayed repeatedly until the flag is set. And the bigger we make the interval, the longer the CPU will continue to display the same light. The longer each light is displayed, the slower the lights appear to move. Once the carry flag is set, the next statement is executed. This statement reads the state of the eight switches that correspond to the eight LEDs that are flashing and stores it in a variable A. The next statement compares the state of the LEDs with the state of the switches and turns off an LED if its switch is also up at the same instant. It also adds an additional light if the switch position and the LED position don't match. 
This is a nifty trick that uses binary logic to compare two numbers and remove any values that are the same while adding any values that are different. It's called an exclusive OR. What an exclusive OR does is compare each digit of a number to the same digit in another number. If there is a difference in the numbers, it sets the corresponding digit of the result to 1. If the values are the same, it sets the corresponding digit of the result to a 0. So if we use binary numbers to represent the lights and switches, we might have a situation like this. Here the fourth LED is lit, but the player has flipped the fifth switch. Comparing the digits yields a result of 00011000. The resulting value becomes the new state of the lights. Thus, every time the player misses the bit, another bit is added to the stream. Here the third LED is lit, and the player has flipped the third switch. Comparing the digits this time yields a result of all zeros. This resulting value becomes the new state of the lights, and in this case, the player has killed the bit and won the game. The next statement sets the bit pattern to the next LED. Keep in mind up to this point, we've still been on the same light. This is when we set the variable that stores the light pattern to the next light. The next statement copies the new pattern to the display variable so that it'll be accessed and displayed when we return to the BEG loop. The final statement sends the program back to the BEG label to start the sequence again. So to recap, the program initializes the light interval and display pattern variables, it displays the first light, saves the state of the switches, compares the state of the switches with the LEDs, and changes the display pattern based on those states. We then change the display pattern to the next light and return to the top of the loop. And that's it. Now that we know how the program works, it's time to actually set the instructions into the altair. But how do we do that without a keyboard? Well, this is where machine code comes in. We need to convert the assembler codes and operands into machine code, which is a binary representation of the instruction. For readability's sake, and to simplify entry, we'll convert the binary codes to their octal equivalents. The address switches on the altair are grouped in sets of three. An 8-digit binary number will convert to a 3-digit octal number, which makes it ideal for entry on the altair, and the conversion between the two is super simple. We first group the binary numbers into sets of 3. The binary instructions are 8 digits, and 8 is not divisible by 3, so the first octal digit will only represent two binary digits. We then convert each of those to a decimal number as if each was a separate binary number. Binary 010, the first zero is implied, equals 2. Binary 111 equals 7, and binary 001 equals 1. Thus, the octal conversion of 10111001 binary is 271. Splitting the binary 00100001 splits into 000, again the first zero is implied, 100, and 001, or 0, 4, 1, which, coincidentally, is the conversion of the first instruction. Here's the code converted to octal. To make entry easier, we'll put these into three groups of eight based on their octal addresses. And now we're ready to enter the instructions into the altair. But first, a little explanation as to how the data is entered. In order to enter our program on the Altair, we first need to do a hard reset to set the system up to address zero. We do that by holding up the stop switch and the reset switch at the same time. The address lights are showing nothing, which means we're at address zero. What we need to do is enter in the code and then deposit that code in the correct memory address. Now we need to move to the next memory address to enter the next code. On a side note, don't confuse the numbers on the LEDs or switches with memory addresses. For instance, in order to access memory address 1, you would not flip switch 1. Remember, the Altair works in binary, so the configuration of the switches when looking at memory addresses should correspond to a binary number. So, to examine address 1, you would flip switch 0. Thus, all switches 0 through 7 would be off, except 0, which is the same as binary 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. To examine address 4, you would flip switch 2 and leave all other switches off, and this would be the equivalent of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Again, 
100 is binary 4. Back to the program. We set the address to 1, examine the address by clicking the examine switch. You can see we're at address 1 because the A0 LED is lit. Next, we'll set the next instruction, 000. So we set all switches off and click the deposit toggle. Now we need to move to address 2. You can see how time consuming this can be. Fortunately, the Altair provides a more convenient way to move to the next address and deposit a new code. That's done via the deposit next switch. So we're on address 1 and we're ready to move to address 2 for the next code 000. Instead of setting the switches to binary 2 and flipping examine, we can just set the code, in this case we need to do nothing since the switches are already at 000, and click deposit next. This will move to the next address in memory and set it to 000. Deposit next enables us to simply enter a code, click deposit next, enter the next code, click deposit next, etc. until we're done. So let's continue. Now that we've completed entering in all of the codes, we're ready to run the program. To do that, we need to set the instruction pointer back to address zero. And we do that by doing a hard reset, which is toggling the stop and reset switches. Finally, we flip the run switch to start the program. If you've entered it correctly, it should be acting like this. Hopefully yours is working. If so, then congratulations. If not, then you may want to re-enter the whole program. What happens if you want to edit code? Well, I'll show you by making a change to the program. We'll edit the parameter that changes the speed of the light. Anytime you want to change an instruction, it's a simple method of setting the address of the instruction, clicking examine, changing that value, clicking deposit, and then setting the instruction of the last instruction entered and clicking examine. Looking at the code, the address of the instruction we want to change looks to be five, but in reality, that's the address for the code, not the operator and we want to change the operand. The operand is at address six. So we set the switches to address six. We click examine, and you should see D3, D2, and D1 lit, which is the value 14 that we set during the original program. Let's set it to something much higher, like 128. We do that by setting switch seven up and all other switches down. Click Deposit to change the value, and then reset the system. If we click Run again, you should see the light moving very fast. Now let's try to slow it down. Click Stop, and again set the switches to address 6, and click Examine. D7 should be lit, because that's the value we just set. 
Let's now set it to a low value, say two, and click deposit. Again, reset the system and run it, and the light should be just about crawling. And there you have it. That's what programming was like on the Altair 8800.